Tracy Woodruff. I am from UCSF. I'm the director of the program. We've got to talk about environment. Our program is dedicated to creating healthier environments for reproduction and development by preventing exposure to harmful chemicals in the environment. We have three pieces to the program, which will touch on the themes that you've already heard today, uh, research, and then research translation into improved clinical care and improved science-based public policies. Uh, the, um, it's just, I'm gonna pull upon some of the things that Eric said and some of the things Mike said to talk about well, what are the driving forces that are coming to bear on why we are so uh, excited about the possibilities of bringing stem cell research into the world of environmental health. So I think Eric already talked about this. There's a lot of manufactured chemicals that we have in the environment. Um, the numbers go anywhere between 80 to 87,000 chemicals. These are chemicals that are known by the US government to be produced or manufactured. Of course, as Eric said, not all of them are produced in great quantities. Uh, but there's at least 2,000 that are produced or imported in over a million pounds per year. The crux of the problem is, is that for most of these chemicals, which I'll talk about how we come into contact with them, we have very little information about their ability to impact health. And just to illustrate uh, that concept in a little more depth, uh, this is the percent of chemicals that don't have information about each of these endpoints that we might care about, and I think each of them were talked about a little bit in the presentations. So immune, you know, development such as autism, cancer, reproductive health, developmental health, you'll see that all of them, the number is greater than 40%, and sometimes close to approaching 100%, where we just really don't have the information we need if people are coming in contact with these chemicals. And as Eric said, we're uh, having a lot of concern about what those health effects might be. So there's a lot of converging forces that are focusing to uh, basically ramp up what we're doing on toxicity testing, basically increase our ability and the number of chem our ability to test chemicals and the number of chemicals that we're testing. And I'm going to talk about four of those different things that are uh, really rapidly changing and have been, uh, I would say, increasing in their pace over the last, maybe uh, certainly in the last five years, but certainly in the last year. And I think that we're going to be seeing a lot more attention focused on this idea about how do we test all these chemicals and, and that's where stem cells come in as one of the tools that we can use for a number of different reasons to try and figure out what we should know about these chemicals. So biomonitoring, um, the increasing burden of chronic disease in the population, there's a growing set, different set of segments among the public who care about these chemicals. Uh, Mike mentioned BPA, that's a very, uh, probably many people know that chemical, bisphenol A, because it's been in the news a lot, because it's in baby bottles. Uh, primarily concerns from baby bottles, but it's also in the lining of cans, and as more and more people are talking about this, not in the, only in the science sphere, but in the public sphere, the public is becoming concerned about what do these chemicals mean for exposure, not only to me, but to my children. And then the last is that there's just, uh, a lot of increasing signs that are linking environmental chemicals to adverse health outcomes. A lot like the studies that, uh, that were talked about in terms of the pesticides and the autism. So increasing burden of chronic disease, I think when people in the public sphere are talking about this, and I think this uh, is a big driver in terms of the autism research, is people are seeing more people or more kids with chronic health conditions. Um, these are just an example of some of the things that have been documented to be going up over the last 20 years. Asthma, autism, uh, certain childhood cancers, obesity is a big concern now, not only for children but for, also for adults. There's also um, uh, numbers both for the U.S. and in specific populations reporting declines in reproductive function and uh, certain cancers. And what is uh, emerging between some of these increasing chronic conditions uh, and the science is that there's a lot of um, emphasis on this developmental origin of disease, which Mike talked about in terms of the growing literature showing that there's a fetal programming that can occur that can predispose uh, that developing child or adult to some type of uh, adverse health outcome. I'm not gonna go through all the many scientific studies that have been done, but I want to point out that there have been a sufficient number of scientific studies that have been done that uh, professional societies, including scientific societies uh, like the Endocrine Society, 
have started to note the number of uh, scientific studies that have been done and have been putting out scientific statements about their concern about environmental chemicals and developmental health. This just came out this summer. It's from the Endocrine Society. It's the Endocrine Society, uh, the first ever scientific statement, and it's about endocrine disrupting chemicals. And Eric talked about what endocrine disrupting chemicals are, which are essentially chemicals that uh, have been identified to alter the hormonal system, which is uh, how the Endocrine Society defines it. And they say in their statement that no endocrine system is immune to endocrine disrupting chemicals, and that the evidence for adverse reproductive outcomes from exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals is strong, and there's mounting evidence for effects on other endocrine systems, including thyroid, neuroendocrine, obesity, metabolism, and insulin, and glucose homeostasis. From the public sphere side of this, the fact that uh, uh, this is a professional society which has clinicians and scientists in it, and they came out and made this kind of uh, statement about chemicals and how this may be impacting a number of different adverse health outcomes that uh, we mentioned that are also being discussed out in the public, uh, raises the concern about, well, what do we know about chemicals and um, what can we do about them? And just to uh, the other sort of, uh, the other force that's coming to bear on this, which is raising the ante in terms of public concern, is that we have had, since basically the turn of the century, an increasing ability to measure these chemicals inside people. Uh, it started with um, the Centers for Disease Control uh, doing a lot, putting out a lot of data on what chemicals are in the general public. Um, Eric mentioned that California now has a biomonitoring program which will uh, be looking at chemicals in the California population. This is an example of some of the data that comes from the CDC report. And uh, we just went through and we picked out some of the chemicals that are in there. Phthalate, <coughs> bisphenol A, preferred alcohol chemicals, parabens, and PCBs. These are all chemicals that have been shown in some type of study to disrupt the endocrine system. But what people are beginning to see is even though we know people are coming into contact through air, food, or drinking water to these chemicals, we are now measuring these chemicals at uh, relatively ubiquitous uh, levels in the US population. So for phthalates, anywhere to 50 to 97% of people have some value measured in their body. Uh, this phenyl A, over 90% for, for uh, apple chemicals, almost 100% of people have these in their body. Parabens, anywhere from a third to 100%, and PCBs, um, around uh, well over 50% of the people. Uh, and some of these chemicals have been banned. PCBs were banned in the 1970s but because they're persistent, they remain around, and people continue to be exposed. The sources of these chemicals are all around us, so anything from your personal care products to um, things that you use in your home, gets into the air, the food, the drinking water, people can become exposed to And this is just an example that shows both uh, what we know and what we don't know about products. This might be something you I just got this on the internet. You can buy this in the store. And this is a list of all the ingredients in a skin lotion application. And as you can see, there are a lot of ingredients in them. And the first one is water. Okay. You probably know about that. But cyclopentocycloxane, uh, zinc oxide, cyclomethicone, dimethicone, et cetera, et cetera. I highlight methyl, methylparaben here. Methylparaben, uh, back in the previous slide, has been found in over 90% of people. There's no current national toxicology program that I can find study on this. Everybody has it. So what do we do? Well, you know, what are we going to do about this? Is this going to be a concern or not? We don't really have any good idea. This issue about not knowing about all these chemicals has been recognized by many different people. But I just want to point out that the Government Accounting Office, which uh, reports to Congress, um, they put out a report every couple of years that talks about what are the most important things that the government should be focusing on. And in 2009, they added two new ones. One was transforming EPA's process for assessing and controlling toxic chemicals. The other was modernizing the outdated U.S. financial regulatory system. So you see, <laughs> knowing about chemicals is probably, to them, is as important 
is fixing the uh, financial crisis. So I, I think this uh, shows you the level of uh, concern that people have about these. And as Jeff mentioned, EPA just released yesterday uh, their uh, initiative, the Obama administration's initiative, to basically know more and do more about all these chemicals. Uh, what the the new plan has six points to it, but uh, the critical part for understanding about chemicals is that chemicals need to be reviewed against uh, safety standards based on sound science and protective of human health. And that manufacturers need to provide all that data. So there's a lot of push to have more data. Now this is um, part of reforming the current government approach to how we deal with chemicals in the U.S., which is going to be uh, legislation that will be proposed in Congress within the next month. And again, California. California is a great leader in many things, including the environment, not only in uh, understanding where pesticides come from and stem cells and all the other things, but they also are a leader in uh, this area called uh, green chemistry, which is essentially uh, knowing about chemicals, knowing which ones are harmful, and then uh, manufacturing chemicals that are not going to be harmful. Mike already talked about the challenges to toxicity testing. Um, we have most of our data comes from animal studies. That's a lot of ethical reasons for that. We don't want to test it on people. Um, we have to. Exp uh, the animal studies traditionally have done uh, been done with high dose testing for um, the, primarily for efficiency reasons. Um, and then the other uh, thing that comes into play is there's a lot of variability in the human population when we're trying to look at, well, we have this data for a toxic chemical, if we have it from an animal study, how do we make it relevant to all the different kinds of people in the population, including genetic variation, life stage. Another big driver in, um, in the current discussions about environmental health and toxic chemicals is early life susceptibility and the fact that exposures that occur early in development can have a uh, stronger or unique effect to uh, later uh, effects, and then variability in disease status. Now I just note that, the, that I mean, as you all know, there's many things that influence whether you are healthy or sick. So it's not just whether you're exposed to toxic chemicals, it's your genetic makeup, it's where other things that uh, influence where you live, but the uh, focus on toxic chemicals is that it could be that this could be an important contributor and it's also a preventable exposure. This just illustrates the time lag that we have for how we evaluate chemicals. So if we look at epidemiology studies, like Eric talked about, those can take one to three years. And when we get the results, we don't. Um, they can uh, still need further interpretation, or there will still be further discussions about it. So it's a long time frame to look at uh, human uh, observational studies. Uh, the rodent testing is is also slow. Uh, National Toxicology Program test of carcinogen takes two years. Um, there's alternative animal models, uh, animal models such as fish or flies, like you talked about. But you know, it's they're also limited in terms of the ability to test the many many chemicals we are concerned about. So there's been a big push to move towards these biochemical and cell-based in vitro assays. This is from an article in Science published by the now director of NIH, Francis Collins, the former director of uh, Office of Research and Development at EPA, George Gray and John Fisher with NIHS, talking about we are in this transformative stage and that really in order to meet this, these forces that are coming to bear about environmental chemicals, that there's good, we need to revolutionize toxicity testing. And this, there are actually two reports that the National Academy of Sciences have put out. I think a US EPA funded um, a large part of these. The interim report is in the yellow, but the final report is Toxicity Testing in the 21st Century, a Vision and a Strategy. And basically, as the um, forces come to bear about you know, improving our ability to test chemicals, uh, the NAS put out these design criteria for testing <coughs> environmental agents, which is we need to cover the broadest set of chemicals, endpoints, and life stages. So if you imagine you have one chemical, you're going to still be caring about, it doesn't matter when you're prenatally exposed, doesn't matter when you're exposed as a child, doesn't matter if you're exposed as an adult, doesn't matter if you're exposed when you're older. OK, well, that's four different things for one chemical. Then we care about neuro, immuno, cancer, reproductive 
those are four different things. By four. You see, just even one chemical can have multiple different uh, complexities to the testing. Um, a big driver in this new toxicity testing is to reduce the number of animals. I mean, animal studies have been uh, valuable for identifying environmental chemicals, but you know, ethically, we'd also like to reduce the number of animals that we're using for that, too. Um, the cost and time factor, thousands of chemicals, many different tests, you can see it's going to be very expensive. How can we uh, increase efficiency and lower costs? And then understanding this mode of action and dose response information is going to be critical when it moves into the policy process and you have regulatory agencies like the US EPA uh, making decisions about uh, where to set safety standards. This is a quote from uh, uh, the, toxicity, the Toxicity Testing NAS report. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says that um, we could transform toxicity uh, transform toxicity testing from a system based on whole animal testing to one founded primarily on in vitro methods that evaluates changes in the biological processes using cells, cell lines, or cellular components, preferably of human origin. And this is where we get into the stem cell idea. And I mean, of course, there's a lot of, I mean, you point out all the pitfalls about moving from the whole animal testing to the cell lines. but. The toxicity testing in the 21st century is meant to, is a you know visionary document to form where we want to go with uh, testing of environmental chemicals in the future. So the, the promise or the beauty of stem cells is that uh, we can look at biological interactions and perturbations at the very earliest stages of development, and so. Uh, what's so exciting is there's so many different ways to look at it, whether you're looking at the very early blastocyst stage, such as the data you presented, or you start to focus on some of these lines that um, uh, are predicted for neurotox or some of the other endpoints that some of the lines have been developing. Uh, that is very exciting because as we can invest in that and move forward, give us, um, we can start to use that to sort of screen out and uh, test some of these environmental chemicals. So stem cells are obviously human relevant because they come from humans. Um, they clearly address early life susceptibility. They're the very earliest of uh, life and we can get learn a lot from uh, susceptibility to environmental chemicals. Uh, Mike talked about the ability to identify different mechanisms and targets. <coughs> this is a very important area because as we test one chemical and um, we look and see, for example, say a chemical disrupts the thyroid system, which then leads to autism. Well, if we find out how it does that, we can test the other chemicals against whatever that thyroid disruption mechanism is. And we don't need to always go to autism in order to screen chemicals. I think this is um, where we're moving in terms of looking at these upstream uh, biological uh, markers to try and be more efficient in our, ultimately, in our decision making policy process. And of course, as you were talking in terms of these trades with many different cells, <laughs> many different ways to look at it, it increases the our ability to uh, rapidly test some of these environmental chemicals. And so I'm going to end there. I just uh, want to say that uh, the thing that is really amazing about the interplay between research and policy is when I listened to Eric give his talk about autism, some of the reason we have so much research in autism is because people had kids who were autistic and that drove the research program. Then the research comes back and says, well, we have certain things that we care about in terms of autism, and then that drives the public policy. So there's a very important feedback loop that happens. Sometimes it happens from the research side, but sometimes it happens from the <coughs> pressures certainly as we're seeing now on trying to test more chemicals that then can drive the research. Thank you.